Now this is going to be perhaps a different type of Good Friday lecture a class from what many of you are accustomed to experiencing. This is a teaching church. As a matter of fact, I think of this church itself as a school because this is really what it is. Here we call our philosophy the science of living. We don't have a dogma, but rather philosophy, the science of living, which sometimes I more correctly call the science of self-awareness. And I love to do the introductory statement on this. Science, from the original Greek word, ginoskai, meaning to know. So then the science of living meaning to know how to live. This is very important. You know, it's quite a sad thing to go all the way through this segment of life on earth without ever learning how to live. And too many people are doing just that, going all the way through this earth experience without ever really learning how to live, without learning really who they are. I had a very interesting three and three-quarter hours last Saturday night in Beverly Hills with a group of medical doctors of various specialties, psychiatrists among them, educators and attorneys. One gentleman there was in charge of the educational system for a large city that I will not name. And we were talking about the importance of people coming to know themselves. So this outstanding educator went so far as to say that in school, when kids have problems, even with their spelling, it relates to their self-knowledge, to their self-image. And I found that very interesting. Now this evening, our formal subject is the glory of the cross. And I'd like to read a text to you from the sixth chapter of Romans, the sixth and seventh verses. And now that you're all comfortably seated, we're going to stand and read this together for emphasis. I may put you through different changes here from what you're accustomed to, either in church or in class, but there's a reason for that also. I'm always aware of the fact that we are working with the subconscious mind, educating it and re-educating it, conditioning it and reconditioning it. And you see, when you stood up, your subconscious mind also came to a new point of attention because it knows that it's about to hear something important. And so now, from the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, the sixth verse, and I'm going to have you repeat this after me as I shall pause for emphasis. Our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. And we're going to read that once more for emphasis. Our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin, the body of sin might, be destroyed. might be destroyed. All right, you may be seated. This evening we're talking about the glory of the cross. Most of us have heard about the old rugged cross. I remember when I was growing up, my mother would sing about the old rugged cross. One line says, I will cling to the old rugged cross. And as you've heard me say before, I clung to the old rugged cross and it kept getting more rugged every day. But then I remembered that that was not the end of that stanza. That was not the end of that sentence in the song. But the song goes on to say, not only I will cling to the old rugged cross, but 
and exchange it some day for a crown. And that's where I saw the light. I said, aha, there is a point in my experience where I am to exchange this rugged cross, this heavy cross, this burdensome cross for a crown. It says someday, so that leaves it up to me to choose which day. And I choose this day. Growing up in Christianity, I always thought also that people made Good Friday too much of a day of doleful mourning. There was too much of this weeping around the cross. And so I began to search for some greater meanings to the event which we call the crucifixion. And I'm going to share with you now some of my interpretations. The glory of the cross is that it symbolizes the crossing out of negative self-identity. And I'm going to have you write this statement. The glory of the cross is that it symbolizes the crossing out of negative self-identity. I want to be repetitious on this and have you repeat this phrase after me. The crossing out of negative self-identity. And when we say crossing out, I'm going to have you make the sign of the cross so that you will now come to a new understanding of what it's all about. Come on. The crossing out of negative self-identity. Once again, with the sign of the cross, the phrase that I've just given you. Come on. The crossing out of negative self-identity. And here now is another statement that I wish you to write. Negative self-identity must die that we might live. You see, already you're coming to a greater understanding of the crucifixion. And in the crucifixion correctly understood, it is negative self-identity that dies that we, must, that we might live. Negative self-identity must die that we might live. Repeat that with me. Negative self-identity must die that we might live. Now that's the truest and a greater meaning of the old Christian statement, he died that we might live. What is the he that must die? Negative self-identity must die that we might live. You see, a person cannot live abundantly unless negative self-identity dies. Let's take this from the point of poverty for a moment. The poverty self-identity in the mind of an individual must die that the person might prosper. The failure self-identity must die that the person might succeed. The sad self-identity must die that the person might live happily. Now what of some of these negative self-identities which must die in order that we might live? I just named some of them after a certain fashion. Some people have, for example, a sick self-identity. And the sick self-identity must die that we might live in health. And to give you an example of a person with a sick self-identity, I point out to you again the man at the pool who waited for the troubling of the water that he might get into it and be healed. I just love to use him for an example, and, and quite often I do. You remember the Bible tells us that there was a pool of water in Jerusalem by the temple where the sick and the maimed and the halt would congregate. 
because at a certain season an angel would come down from heaven and trouble the water and whoever stepped in first after the water was troubled or blessed by the angel would be healed. And there was a man lying by this pool waiting for the troubling of the water but before the water was troubled or blessed Jesus came by and Jesus said to this man do you want to be made whole do you want to be well and you notice that right away the man didn't didn't even say yes I would like to be healed yes I would like to be well but the first thing that he said when he opened his mouth was well you know I've been here 38 years sick <laughs> That's a dead giveaway. That man had what? A sick self-identity. Can you imagine this? Here is Jesus himself walking by the pool saying to him, Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be well? As a matter of fact, he was rather comfortable in his sickness. He was rather smug and snug in his sick self-identity and he had given himself over to such a, a chronic case of sick self-identity that the idea of being well, being whole, being healed didn't even faze him. He'd rather make an excuse and stay sick. Now it sounds like I'm describing some people you know, doesn't it? <laughs> You see, sometimes it's so convenient just to be sick and have that disability and collect checks from it. <laughs> Mailman comes to your house the first day of every month, brings that check. All you have to do is lay there and groan, <laughs> grunt, complain, and keep your silks, your and keep your sick self-identity. Fortunately, Jesus, being a master of mind, science, and spiritual technology, understood what to do and spoke to the man with the speed of lightning, the word of command, take up your bed and walk, right in the middle of his complaint, take up your bed and walk, and kind of shocked his subconscious sick image and before it could complain again, the man was on his feet walking. Beware of developing a sick self-identity. And if you've had a certain complaint so long that you've developed a sick self-identity, that sick self-identity must die in order that you might live in health. Now, let us consider for a moment those who may be suffering from a sad self-identity. I'm sure that we all can think of someone that we've encountered at some point in time and space who make a career out of being miserable. <laughs> and not only do they make a career out of being miserable, they try to make other people miserable with them, and if you will not be miserable with them, you're not their friend. Some of these people may be blood relatives. I know of someone who told me once, Reverend Ike, you've been telling us to take vacations so that we could visit whenever we wanted to different parts of the world and different parts of the country and I've decided I'd like to go back home to see my old uncles and aunties and my family but I just remember that I've got some of them down there every time I see them all they do is complain and she said so I've decided when I go on my vacations and to visit that I'm not going to visit them you know you have to be very careful of people who have chronic sad self-identity and this is why I've given you these words for your guidelines always in your heart say to people if you won't let me pull you up I'm not going to let you pull me down
If you're not going to let me share my joy with you, I'm not going to let you make me miserable. I'm not interested in sadness. I'm not interested in the blues. This should be your attitude. And there does come a point when you just release people after you have tried to share your joy with them, you've tried to share your good with them, and they don't accept it, then that's a point for you to just ease on down the road. But if you truly want to be happy, then the sad self-identity must die that you might live in happiness. Just as the scripture we just read stated, our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. And the old man is that old sad self-identity, that old sick self-identity. That old failure self-identity must be crucified, must die, that you might live. Another thing, some people with these sad self-identities seem to think somehow or the other that perhaps there's some kind of virtue, a holiness in being sad. Some people seem to think that they can't serve God if they're too happy. Some people think it's a sin to be too happy. Oh, how can you be so happy when there are millions starving? <laughs> how can you enjoy your food when other people don't have any? Well, hell, if I starved, it wouldn't help them. <laughs> it would just be another starving person in the world. Wouldn't, stop, wouldn't solve a damn thing. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> you do not help to cheer people up by being sad. Even in the Old Testament, we are told, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And it is important that every day of your life you feel and practice the joy of the Lord. Away with sadness, away with the blues, away with unhappiness. As a matter of fact, medical authorities now tell us that perhaps the greatest illness in the whole world that causes other illnesses is depression. It is unhealthy to be depressed. It is unhealthy to be sad. It is unhealthy to be unhappy. <laughs> Remember that. The sad self-identity must die that you might live and experience the joy of the Lord. The hateful self might die, must die, that you might live in love. And here again, there are those people who hang on to their hatred with all their might. <laughs> and I know some of you are saying, oh, but Reverend Ike, I don't hate anybody. I don't have any hatred. Maybe not, but some of you are hanging on to hatred. You know, I told you about that in that sermon, forgive and forget. And hatred is just as bad as hatred. They both will do you in. You must die to hatred and to hatred that you might live the abundant life. So if you're still hurting over something that somebody did to you, you'd better get that cleared out of your mind that you might experience the love of God. Some of you may have had some bad experiences with people and you're, you're full of fear. 
so that you're like David was at one point where he expressed himself and he said, I said in my haste, all men are liars. And there's too much of that attitude sometimes. People will say, hey, nobody's no good. And if you feel that way that nobody's no good, it's because you're no good. Here again, I quote Reverend Ike's celebrated lecture. I meet no one but me. And I'll tell you, it is a danger signal when you get to the point that you actually feel that nobody's any good. You are in trouble. <laughs> but yet there are people who are totally bitter like that. Nobody's any good. Everybody's dishonest. Everybody's out to get you. Well, that's why they get you. <laughs> so why complain? <laughs> you see, so many times people think and speak these things on themselves and when they happen, they wonder why. And honestly, if, if you have that kind of unloving attitude and belief in your heart that nobody's any good, you are really in trouble because you're going to draw people to you that are going to do you in because you believe that, you see. All right. That self-identity of hate and of hurt must die that you might live in the experience of love. 